This is EDUC 4703U, Teaching and Learning, Problem-Based Learning. This is Session 3, Video Clip 3. The title of this video clip is Some Ideas About Learning, Behaviorism, and Cognitivism. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. What is epistemology and how is epistemology related to learning? Second question. What are the commonalities in the two types of behaviorism described in the video clip? Third question, what is the relationship between cognitivism and behaviorism? And fourthly, science is essentially an empirical field of study. What problem is presented when science relies exclusively on empirical data as knowledge? We're taking a look at age-old ideas here, and uh, as illustrated in the slide, we can find that um, even Plato began to uh, question these particular kinds of uh, issues. The definition of epistemology that we're working on is simply that epistemology is the study of knowledge and how knowledge is attained. Throughout the ages, philosophers and those with philosophic bent have addressed these questions. This and the following clip are not intended to be comprehensive in the treatment of this subject, but are offered as an introduction to concepts in this field. It is expected that learners will complete uh, more extensive reading on their own. Plato turned to this problem and asked questions such as, what is knowledge? What is knowing? How do we know what we know? We will turn primarily to the question of how knowledge is attained. Beginning with this question, Allow us to, uh, allows us to sample earlier thinking. For instance, Plato viewed epistemology to include topics such as logic, belief, perception, language, science, and knowledge. Major distinctions were made between certain knowledge and uncertain opinion. More recently, the acquisition or attainment of knowledge has been viewed using two different methodologies. One, knowledge that is known by experience, that is, it is empirical or based on evidence provided by the senses. These are essentially inductivist approaches, that is, they look for the generalities that arise for, from all of the specific instances that are investigated. The second methodology is knowledge that is known independently of experience, that is, it is non-empirical or arrived at beforehand, usually by reason i.e. rationalism. These are essentially deductivist approaches, that is, they look for evidence in specific instances or cases which confirm a pri prior hypothesis. So then beginning, beginning to take a look at the empirical side of things, we will look at behaviorism first. Behaviorism itself is characterized by the idea that everything that is done by living creatures, including humans, is considered to be a behavior. All behaviors are assumed to occur as responses to stimuli, that is, changes in the environment. Learning, therefore, is essentially taken to occur as learned or remembered responses to these stimuli. So that you have learning occurring when you remember the response that you used before, prior to the same stimulus. Ivan Pavlov, uh, 1849 to 1936, is mostly remembered for his work with dogs. Dogs were provided with, in, in a series of studies anyways, dogs were provided with food as a stimulus to salivate, that is to drool. Um, Pavlov then began ringing a bell immediately before presenting the food to the dogs. After some time, the dogs would salivate when they heard the bell ring regardless of whether the food was present or not. This technique of associating certain behaviors with specific stimuli is referred to as operant conditioning and is still used as a primary form of training with many pets. I've used it with my own dog. One word of caution is in order though. When using operant conditioning with pets in order to fix undesirable behaviors, it may, we may well take hundreds of repetitions for the change to take. I'm inclined to wonder if this holds true for humans as well. Another well-recognized figure in the development of behaviorism is B.F. Skinner, 1930 to 1990. Skinner created a theory of radical behaviorism 
which seeks to understand behavior as a function of a series of reinforcing environmental stimuli. The terms positive and negative reinforcement were coined. Negative reinforcement is taken to refer to the strengthening of behaviors through the removal or avoidance of an aversive sti event, a stimulus that causes a behavior that terminates the stimulus. For example, rolling up a window, which is behavior, in a moving vehicle blocks the wind, which is a stimulus and an aversive event. It's interesting no to note that negative reinforcement is not the same thing as punishment. Positive reinforcement, however, is defined as the strengthening of behaviors through the addition of an appetite, uh, appetitive event or a stimulus. For example, providing food, a stimulus, and an appetitive event to teachers when they attend, that is a behavior, so they're attending, a staff meeting. Behaviorism is still commonly applied in many classrooms as a means of attempting to control student behavior. Moving briefly to cognitivism, Noam Chomsky is uh, an example of a cognitivist. Um, he suggested that language could not be learned purely through conditioning. This sets up the argument uh, that we'll be exploring um, very briefly. Cognitive theorists arose, uh, theories arose at least partially as a response to the behaviorist lack of attention to cognition or to thinking. Behaviorists identified thinking as a behavior and therefore it was subject to reinforcement as are all behaviors according to that theory. Cognitivists ar argued that a person, the way a person thinks shapes the resulting behaviors and therefore thinking cannot be a behavior by itself. The main issues of interest to cognitivists are the ways in which human thought works and the processes of knowing. So an information processing approach is a cognitive way, uh, cognitive approach. And I'm quoting here from Cognitive Theories of Learning um, and I will be giving you the um, URL for this particular um, article. Anyways, the quote goes something like this. The advent of the modern digital computer provided a rich theoretical model for theorizing about human information processing. The information processing architecture of computers strongly framed much early thinking in mon modern cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychologists have spent a lot of effort developing accounts of mechanisms that control information processing. The cognitive theories propose constructs describing information processing mechanisms. The questions about how humans process information, pick up information from the environment, store information in memory, retrieve information from memory, and send information back to the environment are under investigation. People, like computers, acquire information from the environment. Both people and computers store information and retrieve it when applicable to current tasks. Both are limited in the amount of information they can process at a given time. Both transform information to produce new information. And both return information to the environment. Research projects frequently aim at verifying and articulating this theoretical perspective. However, knowledge can be, uh, empirical knowledge can be challenged, and I'm going to present very briefly a uh, series of images that might um, provide some of that challenge. If knowledge is confirmed using sensory information, what happens when the senses can be fooled? Perhaps deriving knowledge using empirical methodologies creates additional questions that are more easily answered using other orientations. So let's take a look at the included graphics. The, these are examples of visual stimuli that confuse the sense of vision and its analysis, which then in turn cannot be trusted to interpret the diagrams appropriately. So in other words, if the senses can't be trusted, can we trust empirical um, knowledge by itself or empirically derived knowledge? Um, so graphic A is a graphic that shows either a vase or two faces, depending on how you actually look at it. Graphic B shows, again, a beautiful young lady who is facing away from the screen or a um, profile of an old lady with a scarf over her head. Diagram C indicates two 
different vertical lines. And the question is, which is the longer of the two? The answer is, they are both the same length. However, we are being fooled, or our sense of vision is being fooled because of the distractors of the end um, ends that are put onto the lines themselves. And finally, um, diagram D, the question is, what is wrong with this particular diagram? The diagram that's shown on this slide illustrates um, a classification system for learning theories described in this course. I will take a couple of minutes right now just to go through the major divisions that we're looking at. So at the beginning, we take a look at epistemology as being the primary study here, and it's being separated, as I suggest earlier in this, um, in this video clip, that uh, there are two lines of thought. So we can go the empirical line of thought, or we can go the rationalist side of, of things. If you follow down the empirical line, um, you come across behaviorism as the first uh, major um, set of ideas, followed afterwards by cognitivism, and I've followed that line of thinking or that reasoning um, in this video clip itself. The next video clip will explore the uh, right-hand side of this diagram, that is the rationalist side of things, and we'll take a look very briefly at humanism and then move on um, to constructivism. And the match between constructivism and cognitivism brought in through interactionisms. So we end up with uh, socio-cognitivism first and then following that up with socio-constructivism. And we'll describe what those are like in the second uh, of this um, set of video clips. On the theoretical side, I would like you to take a look at the article that is um, given here. So read the linked paper. This article gives a brief overview of the relationship and many theoretical structures referenced in this and the next video clip. And the author is uh, Ferrucci. The title of the article is Inductivism, Hypothetical Deductivism, Falsificationism, and Kuhnian Reconciliation. Um, I think you'll find it an interesting paper, and it's not particularly um, long. So uh, read it to your, your heart's content. To finish off this video clip, I'd like to um, suggest these are the synthesis questions that you should be looking at. Number one, how would you characterize the type of learning that is possible in behavioristic environments? What kinds of things can be easily learned and why? And how would you characterize the type of learning that is possible in cognitivistic environments? What kinds of things can be easily learned and why? And how, would, how different would this type of learning be from the behavioristic model? And number three, why is empiricism separated from rationalism when studying epistemology? Isn't rational thought used when studying something in science? Another way of stating this question might be something like, what is the nature of the relationship between inductivist and deductivist thinking processes.